Welcome everybody to the uh, Chaos Community Weekly Call. Um, it's kind of a weird day. Everyone's not everyone. A lot of people are freezing and no power. So um, we're really grateful for those of you who are able to show up. Um, we have a little bit of a light agenda today, which is probably good, um, just so people don't feel like they're missing out if they're unable to make it. But um, we do have a few things to talk about. So uh, if you have not added your name to the agenda and you would like to do that, please feel free to do that on the minutes. I think Matt just posted them in the chat. Um, and we will get started. Oh, one quick thing I wanted to ask everyone um, how they feel about this. I, I think I emailed a few of you, but um, there's an option, I believe, in Zoom to save the chats. Um, I don't know if we want to enable that, if that would be invasive or feel weird to people, like they couldn't ch chat. Um, but sometimes there are really good links that people post in the chat. So, um, and they get lost when we close our Zoom. So I don't know if people have feelings about that. Um, what do you all think? Um, I don't know. I, I the, um, Remember when we were on the UNO Zoom account? I always had the chat, but I never did anything with it. So we were preserving it, but I never posted it or anything like that. So. Normally, I, I recall. Uh, normally, I recall whatever uh, link is posted on the chat. We try to capture that in the meeting notes. So, if these are not even reserved, but the links especially are captured in the notes. I have a question when the in terms of the record of the video versus the chat are they synced at all because I, I could see like if it is is in line with the conversation and you could see how the chats were supplementing what we were discussing but if there's no relation then it, they like the links would provide insight but the like random banter or like plus ones will have no context yeah, that's an excellent question and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else does. I think we can stick with the meeting minutes, just continue to be mindful to put everything that we want to capture in the... Awesome. I, I will say if we do record them, I will probably make less snarky comments in the chat. So it depends on like, what behavior do you want to incentivize? I, I've thought that too. Chat has a tendency of being a little bit snarkier. <laughs> I kind of like the snarky, just that's my personal thing. I like giving people an outlet for that. So uh, I'm totally fine if we do not save the chats. That's, that's awesome, that's fine. All right, let's move on. Um, thank you all for your input on that. I feel better. Um, okay, so the first thing on the agenda is the Google season of docs is open. And I know we have some people, uh, I don't know if any of them are on this call, but um, I know that's been kind of floating around. So not sure what we wanna chat about with that, but if anyone wants to jump in here. So I think the question, the question basically is, do we want to set up ourselves as our own organization? for season of docs, this is season of docs, right? Yeah, and, or uh, the Linux Foundation always provides kind of an umbrella and you can submit things via the Linux Foundation. And apparently we did it via the LF last year, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, we um, did. So it seemed like uh, Venu was kind of inclined to do our own or our own organization, which I don't see any problem in doing that. And we've done this, we had this same kind of conversation with Summer of Code too. You know what I mean? Like, do we submit as part of the LF or do we submit on our own? I think maybe one time we submitted as part of the LF. Georg, do you remember that? Like a really early. And I actually think it wasn't accepted. Like the LF was not I, I think we've always done Google Sum of Code just as chaos. Okay. Well, we always have the option. And so the folks at the LF don't really care, at least when we've had this conversation in the past. So politically, I don't think it's like it causes any 
any commotion, so. It seemed like that was maybe Venu's hesitation to like not put any tension on that relationship or you know, jeopardize it in any way by us kind of going our own way. So if that's the case, then I don't see why we wouldn't do that. Yeah, I agree. So um, one of the things I noticed is talking with some of the other previous Google Summer of Code people, evidently Google likes it when um, you show a lot of cl cross collaborations on these different projects with different groups here and different groups there and things of that nature. So in a way, having your own entity to do that and sit there and show, oh, also collaborating here, here and here looks good. Because they want to see that sweeping um, uh, sort of thing. So, so even more so for an argument to be our own organization. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Um, well, it's one of those things where when people are coming forward and they're trying to figure out who you are and what you are and where they're going to be impacting and all that, you really do need your own brand for that, right? And so, um, and chaos has a very particular thing that it's solving and it's super important. And so having that established outside of it, I mean, if you sit there and think about it, would CNCF do it any other way? They wouldn't, right? They would be, they go into CNCF, CNC. You know what I'm talking about. I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I think, it, I think that it is appropriate to go in there and do that. Because like I said, Google likes, I, I don't know about this other one, but I know that Google normally likes seeing that. Um, and so that's actually what we're trying to do with our stuff too, um, with the IEEE, because IEEE is also gargantuan and I trip, you know, an essay open is yet another separate thing. And so we're just kind of like going, okay, we'll go and do this. And then we're also trying to drag in a bunch of the societies in with us too, to sit there and say, oh no, look, we're cross collaborating here. And we're also reaching out to you guys and the other organizations as well. And so we're trying to sit there and show that, um, you know, community ethos. So it sounds like we have a decision because I don't see any reason not to not to do that. So I already put it in the minutes, so it's already decided. <laughs> um, that's that's all it takes, really, is just to put it in minutes, and then you can pretty much just decide anything you want. Okay, so let's move on. Unless anybody has any final thoughts on that? Nope. Okay. So the next one on the uh, agenda is outreachy. Um, there is a March 1st deadline for the community sign up. And we do have some ideas, some concrete ideas for that. Um, and I see Matt is giving myself and him a, <laughs> an action item <laughs> to just do this. So um, cool, we'll just do that. Uh, is there any discussion we need to have around this? I don't think so. I think you and I can just solicit the ideas just so everybody knows we don't have the, the funds to pay, but we can still, I believe we can still apply because Outreachy gets external support from organizations and that external support can be used to support um, folks associated with projects and where the projects don't necessarily have the funds. Does that make sense? So we can still apply even though we don't. Outreachy normally the project um, provides the funds unlike Google Summer of Code. So I think we still apply and just see how it goes. I like that idea. And it looks like uh, we're gonna center, we're gonna focus um, centrally on the website audits for marketing accessibility and inclusiveness. Um, and I assume that Kevin, you're cool with kind of leading that and being the mentor there, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly take part in it. Uh, I would envision that activity as having uh, several mentors, though, because there are, there are a couple different types of audits, and we, we have had some volunteers for some marketing people to take to kind of take lead on the marketing audit, uh, and and so on and so forth. So. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure that you are in that loop since that touches a lot of what you work on here. So. Um, didn't want to spring that on you if if that if you were not involved. I think that you had brought that up though, so I just want to make sure. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I guess we are cool to move mm -hmm. ahead. There's one other mentorship thing. Just you can put it in the minutes. But here at the university, 
at my university. Um, we do summer internship programs for students, high school students in the area to participate in projects and the university pays them. And so I, Vinod, <clears throat> I think it was Vinod and Matt, I kind of forget, or was it just you, Matt? I think it might've just been you, Matt, <laughs> to kind of say, you know, put together a small, um, you know, a couple paragraphs as to what the engagement might look like. And then those go onto the university website and they get sent out. So we may have some additional mentorship. And I think it was with respect to the DNI badging program. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, I, I know that the part I worked on was for DNI badging. I'm not sure if there was anything else going on there. I'm just curious what, uh, do we have a specific thing for them to work on? I'm just curious. I think it was, okay, so the DNI badging program is based on Arfon Smith's work when he was at GitHub uh, and the Journal of Open Source Software. So the, the kind of the model that Arfon put together was kind of the model that we have implemented with DNI badging, just because we really liked the openness and transparency of how JOS, Journal of Open Source Software was running. Um, JOS has an automated tool called Whedon, get it, Joss Whedon. So, and so one of the things we're doing is taking a look at um, how we can bring the, the work that's been done on Whedon into the DNI badging program to help automate things um, where automation can occur. There's cer certainly still a need for a lot of human interaction and thoughtfulness, but there might be places where we can continue to automate. Did I get that right, Matt? Yeah, we've already built out a lot of the proposal for it, it looks like, but um, I'm, I'm excited to see how that turns out. Sounds good. Have we ever done this internship deal before? I did it a long time ago when I was involved with SPDX. And so it, it, it's, um, it can be tricky, right? Because a, a lot of high school students are not really familiar with just what open source is and how it works. So a lot of time is actually spent just kind of introducing people to, um, to the community and getting them to understand the structure. So it, it takes a little while, but it does work out well. And it's just a really nice experience for a lot of people. I really look forward to having them um, be a part of our community. I think that would be awesome. So, yay, that's exciting. Okay, the next one um, is actually something Sean wanted to talk about, and he is had to step away for a minute. So his chair um, is empty. Yes. His chair is, yeah. <laughs> his chair cannot speak for him, <laughs> sadly. So um, I will let him uh, talk about this in a second. Um, just as a, a side note, uh, Sean and I did have some great conversations about, we did a hackathon on Saturday. Well, he did the hackathon on Saturday um, and it was pretty light turnout, but um, some great ideas came of that uh, for the next hackathon that we're gonna do. And we are gonna do another one. Um, a, we're gonna do uh, a series of these, um, some for the North American um, users and then, uh, we're going to do an Asia Pacific one that's a little more friendly for that time zone as well. So we'll do some, a series of those as well. So um, those will be happening on like a Friday night central U.S. time, which will be like Saturday day for Asia Pacific. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the overall plan. Um, I know that what Sean wanted to ask was uh, to pose this question to the working groups, people who are on the call that, from the different working groups, if there are specific uh, metrics that we want to ca capture data around, but we're not sure how, um, if they can think about that, because that's, we want to kind of take those hackathons, I hate to steal Sean's thunder, don't tell him I'm telling you this, but um, we kind of want to take those hackathons and make them a little more purposeful and deliberate in our, uh, like what the goal is. Um, so uh, we thought it would be great to have a purpose in that helping the working groups kind of figure out or, or nail down some data uh, that they were requiring. So it kind of be like a 
you know, self, uh, not self-serving to chaos, but also to help the kind of bridge the gap between Augur and the metrics and what we're doing there. So, um, and then, you know, use the hackathon as a great venue for that. So people on the call, if you are in a working group now and you can think of um, some requirements that you might have that you would pose to, to volunteers that happen to be working on Augur, um, that would be great. Or just think about it for a little bit and we can bring this up again next week, which might be good since Sean's still not back at his chair. Um, that, would, that would be awesome. So um, yeah. So just to clarify, it's focused around Augur. So there could be some metrics that aren't necessarily as applicable in that case. This is true. Yeah. I also think this is a really good call. Um, what you're talking about, Elizabeth, just because we don't like to develop metrics in a methodological or technical vacuum. <laughs> they need to have some form of getting out into the world. And if we can continue to stay attentive to that, that's a good, good thing. So um, as, as I, I went to the hackathon last Saturday and I thought it was, it was kind of, uh, it was fun. Uh, we didn't, we did have a light turnout, but like uh, we had people, I think one person was interested in the outreach program, which was pretty cool. Um, but it, it something we ran into that I'd like to try and avoid in the future is that we had a, uh, an install debugging session for most of the hackathon. So I, I just want to do something that's a live instance or something that we can do working on something that's easy to spin up. That's all, that's my big concern about it. And that is perfect timing, Sean, because we were just talking about the Augur Hackathon and kind of our plans. And Matt, to your Matt Snell, to your point, um, Sean and I did talk about that, and so we have some ideas floating around. Um, but I will let Sean kind of take this. Sorry, Sean, to put you right on the spot. No, it's it's all right. Sorry about that. My my furnace died two weeks after it finished the garage because just I'm lucky that way. Um, so I'm just following the minutes here. Um, yeah, so I had just brought up that we were um, looking to some uh, guidance from the working groups as to some metrics that they would want some data around that we haven't really exactly solidified yet. So, so, the, so, yeah, I don't want to repeat what you said, but I think there's, there's maybe did you talk about the basic skills pieces of what we discussed? No, but Matt Snell had just brought that up. So, uh, okay. because that, so, like he said, was a big part of it. Yeah. So thing, thing one, I think, start, you know, organizing hackathons around the implementation of metrics or combinations of metrics that people actually want to see displayed or represented together is, I think, a really good way of engaging folks in a hackathon because it gives us a concrete purpose. Um, but the other thing that, that I've talked about is the, the common experience I have in hackathons for Augur or other hackathons is there's this sort of this level of getting your operating environment on your local machine prepared to actually do Python development and open source in this case. And with different operating systems, there are C libraries and things like that that need often to be upgraded versions of Python that need to be tuned. And we usually spend one to two hours of any hackathon on Augur or otherwise getting folks' environments set up. So what Elizabeth, and I think in talking with Elizabeth that, that this is an obstacle for open source software engagement, especially more diverse open source software engagement. So we discussed having, I don't know, uh, sort of workathon, hackathon, like tutorials, perhaps one focused on configuring Python for open source development on your local computer. Another focused on the nuances of GitHub. I think most people understand the very high level functions of GitHub, but few have actually created a fork, merged it back in, worked with branches and had that experience. And sometimes when people get into that, it's an obstacle for going further. Uh, another thing that we discussed was uh, Jupyter Notebooks. I think a lot of experimentation can be done on Jupyter Notebooks, and it's a, a lower bar to entry for getting started. And since most of what we're doing on Chaos is actually working with data and producing metrics, a lot of the initial work can happen in a Jupyter Notebook. So we thought of a special session for that. And that's, I think that completes the thought that Elizabeth began while I was talking to my furnace guy. So 
Um, I, I'm kind of thinking, hearing this and talking about it a little bit makes me think that we need some kind of design or concept focused um, hackathon as well. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in code because there's such an overhead to learning that um, that schema, everything that's involved with Augur, it takes a long time to learn. It took me months. Um, so I think Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying that if we if we could have something that's higher level and like easier to understand right off the bat, or at least we could get them started in an hour or less, uh, I think that'd be very valuable. Especially if we're our, our purpose is like onboarding. It's not necessarily to get um, the way I see it. It shouldn't be necessarily to get things done for Augur as much as it should be to show new people the project. I um, I, I yeah. agree. I agree. I think I think getting people involved in the technical parts of open source it could be Augur, it could be Primor Lab, but the technology isn't what's important. I think bringing the working groups into hackathon environments where essentially we have people who understand a set of requirements that they want met and using things like Jupyter Notebooks and the data underlying Primor Lab or Augur, we can start to actually implement some met you know some the, the combinations of metrics that are most often what people end up asking for so it's very rare that we have somebody ask us to write a jupyter notebook or build a visualization of an individual chaos metric it's almost always a, a, a sort of a symphony of different metrics that together tell a story and and so having the working groups there not for the technical like you can you can sort of bail on the technical part at your leisure, but driving what we might build technically in the course of a hackathon from those requirements, from that design work that you described, I think is that's exactly what we mean. I'm totally popping off today, but I, I just also wanted to say that um, I think the biggest thing we can get in my opinion, this is definitely an opinion thing, but and the biggest thing that we can get from these hackathons for the working groups is to challenge the metrics and challenge how we measure them. Um, I, I think that's a really important part of it. I, I, I would, I think the sort of the other side of that coin is that sometimes it's hard to imagine what a metric actually is unless it's built. And I think there's this re re iterative cycle that will happen where I, people have an idea for a metric, we show them what that metric looks like based on some collection of data. And then they're like, well, okay, what I really meant was X. So by, by being able to iterate, which we could do pretty quickly in Jupyter Notebooks, I think the metrics themselves will mature more quickly. And it also brings this, the technology piece and the metrics piece a little bit closer together um, and shows maybe illustrates that iterative process that's happening slowly in the background right now. I must want to re-ask my question now, because I think it seems like after, before you got back, Sean, I was asking if future hackathons we want to really build out around Augur versus it sounds like what you've just been describing could be something a little bit more general. Um, could be, yeah. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't necessarily apply to Augur in terms of future hackathons. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be working directly with Argo or on or using it even in that context. Yeah, I mean, I think so. So th there's really three ways, four ways that we can get data. One is that Augur has a set of tools and new data that it's collected. Grimoire Lab has a set of data it's collected, but there's also direct calls into the APIs of these platforms that could be used for generating metrics. I, I think there's, and of course, then we can mine the Git logs. So there's, yeah, I think there's a lot of data sources. And I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it needs to be tied directly to Augur. I, I think that's the experience that I would bring, but I don't, need the only, I don't need to be the only person around these hackathons. Like that could be one option. It could be more inclusive from a technology perspective if there's interest. I would propose that we bring one metric as a trial case from each working group and <coughs> do the hackathon not tied to the auger, but as a data source, collecting it and maybe trying it in Jupyter and Notebook to collect the ideas, how it's being implemented. And then we can formalize it in auger or Grimoire Lab as the outcome of the hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. 
It'll depend. I mean, that, yeah, I agree. It'll depend on the metrics. Some metrics require advanced data collection, others don't. Um, it depends what kind of temporal process, you know, what kind of temporal trends you want to show. But yeah, I, I think I wouldn't exclude data sources. I would say we have Percival's a powerful data source. We could gather a bunch of data around a metric from per, you know, using Percival. We could have a bunch of data in Augur. We could have a list of GitHub and GitLab. APIs that deliver that data ready. I don't know, Sophia, if you have other ideas about data sources we might target. I mean, I spend all day in GitHub Archive, so that's always available. Yeah. But I mean, that, that predicates GCP login, but it is a public data set if you have access to it. So that's, that's personal bias here. Yeah, I, I, uh, GitHub Archive is a valid, a valid data source. It has Obvious, obviously, like all of the other public data sources, there are limits to it, but it, there's a lot there. What what kind of access does one need to get access? I mean, it was a long, it's been a long time since I accessed it. I think you need to log in. I should probably try to log into my personal machine and see what that experience is like before I give you a straight answer, because I have a very skewed experience being a Google employee. <laughs> <laughs> Privileged, perhaps? Well, and I can see other other data sets as well, but I know we maintain a public version of the GitHub archive. It is anonymized um, and it is, if you've worked with archive data, it's logs versus active commit streams. So it's, it's a different kind of data source. So it might limit what you can look at, but it's great for sort of aggregate trends and sort of big questions like how many PRs are getting accepted and merged into projects on average. And so you can ask those kinds of like top level questions in a huge data set like that, but it doesn't give you a lot of specifics. So it's great for baselines, but maybe not as good for what's going on day to day in a project. But it, it does get to the repository level. Yeah. So, so, I mean, if you're trying to contrast repositories, at least you can do that and it protects individually identifiable information, obviously better than mining a Git log or calling Git to any of the Git, Git platform APIs, it sounds like. Um, sort of, <laughs> it's a little, <laughs> a little lossy. Um, okay. So it won't, ha it doesn't have say like total number of commits, but it'll track PRs. And then you can see how many commits are part of the PR, but it doesn't necessarily give you the complete picture of contributor activity. Okay. My experience has been good with that data set. So getting access to it was not an issue in the past. Okay. One of the things I have observed in the open source is a lot of open source program use Jira and we have not been able to look at that platform in any sense or like I haven't come across in any of the chaos discussion looking at the Jira in detail. So Jira is more like an issue tracker, though, isn't it? Yeah, Jira is issue tracker, and Grimoire Lab does support Jira. Okay. And, and Jira is an Atlas is that an Atlassian product? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. it is. And I wouldn't say I wouldn't say a lot of projects use Jira, uh, but there are there are a few notable. Uh, Linux Foundation projects. That Even the here. Apache, Apache uses it. Yeah. So maybe add it to the, like looking into that data source also. Well, there, there's, there's definitely an access issue there, right? There aren't, there aren't public JIRA data sets. Are there? I don't that know. Can be an issue. I don't know. I, I, I would imagine know. that the only access you have to the JIRA data is if you're a member of the project. I know it's the I know the Atlassian, like they have Bitbucket. It's the only Git platform that I need to actually log in to clone a public repository. So it does seem to be a you know, just generally speaking, a bit more locked down than GitLab or GitHub. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna bring this conversation back around. Um, so it sounds like we have a really good start for this kind of new path that we're gonna take uh, for these for these hackathons. Um, so uh, Sean, what would be the next steps for people on this call, if there are any? 
So I, I think what I'm hearing is essentially what we laid out yesterday in terms of the skills focused um, hack like events, we should we should put out there. I think those serve those are independent of Augur or Gamora Lab or any other platform. Um, I think the Asia Pacific uh, call the hackathon that's focused on the giddy worker that they want to build for Augur that can stand alone. And I think when it comes to these to the working group focused requirements, you know, here's here's a set of, of, of metrics that we want to try to build out with tools. I, I think we maybe make them more agnostic and that the advanced work is making data available, making the location of data available from a number of different metric platforms like the GitHub, you know, GitHub archive, here's your path, the GitLab, GitHub API, here's your path. Um, here's a Percival data set we collect it or we collect it with Percival or whatever else Grimoire Lab might recommend. Uh, here's an Augur database. We give people multiple options for engineering it. Um, and and see what happens, you know, see how people want to build a metric out. Um, and and I, I'm totally open to saying, okay, we're not going to use any of those things. Like some, if somebody defines a data set, like a plate, like a test data set that we want to build a metric from, I would, I would be okay facilitating a hackathon partnership with Georg or other folks from Viturgia or Google or wherever, just focused on the metrics. Because I think, I think the focus on the metrics without caring about what technology we're using is how we get the working groups engaged and under, you know, helping us to build tools that more closely serve the needs of the community. That's my opinion, but I welcome alternative views. I think that sounds reasonable. Okay, so I think we're good to move on then, unless anyone has any final thoughts for Sean or for anyone. Okay, cool. Let's let's move on because we do have a few other things to, on the agenda here. Um, so the next one is uh, community reviews on the metrics are still ongoing. So if you've not had a chance to look at some of the metrics that have been released in this um, under this community review window, feel free to poke around and see uh, what you think about them. It does not have to be in the working group that you usually attend. It could be you can offer your feedback on any of the metrics. So don't feel con constrained by your imagination. It's all up to you. Um, and I see that Georg has a big thanks, Ray. Um, so Ray apparently has been doing some work, even though he's not on this call, we will give him a shout he out. Has. He definitely has. So across working groups. So within your working group to maybe take a look at the PRs that are coming across to address some of these issues, that'd be good too. Definitely. Okay, so the next one is dependencies added by Matt G. So I will let you chat about that, Matt. Yeah, so I made I, I made a picture that solves everything. So you can look at my, <laughs> my picture. So in uh, kind of in the, I, the, the same light as bringing tooling and metrics closer together. Um, obviously we've been talking about dependencies and risk and we've been talking about dependencies in the Asia Pacific call and also kind of why we care. So I just, I was kind of playing around with some boxes and just trying to think about like what we have available to us um, just in terms of when we can start, um, when we can actually map the dependencies that we care about, what are the, what are the things that we actually want to ask questions against that dependency set, right? So we, I, I create, um, you know, a list of, of 20 packages that I care about as part of this dependency world that I live in, whether it's upstream or downstream, I don't particularly care. Um, and I'm just trying to listen to the conversation as to what people seem to be concerned about. And so licensing seems to be one of those things that people care about. 
vulnerabilities seems to be one thing that people particularly care about. Um, and then there's the tsunami security scanner. It's from Google. I'm not particularly familiar with what this is. <laughs> so uh, not looking at you, Sophia. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just trying to think through ways that that we could, and this is obviously just to augur, I just threw that in there, just ways that we can start kind of thinking about architecture that might be useful once we start getting dependency data. And so the, like the managed project information, you know, package information, that was just, that was the passing comment in the Asia Pacific call that you can start getting package level information, say from the POM file in Maven, right? So you can, that might be pre-specified ahead of time, like the packages that you care about on a particular build. And you can ask questions against that POM file. Um, and so in the case of Augur, we have license scanning that can be done using kind of a stripped down version of Phosology. There is no current, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no current CVS scanner for vulnerabilities inside of Augur? Uh, I don't think as CBS, like, no, we don't, we don't scan the security databases right now. For, yeah, Augur, for vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just kind of keeping, like if we're asking around, if we're asking for things like vulnerabilities, just kind of knowing what our technical lim limitations are in the project. If we're asking around things like security, again, I'm not quite sure what that is with different from vulnerabilities. Kind of thinking what would be required to to even <laughs> ask questions around security so i don't know i'm just trying to you can all say this is the worst the colors are horrible the arrows are terrible i don't care but i'm, I'm just trying to bring some order to the conversation that seems to be occurring at risk and seems to be occurring in asia pacific so that's all I would love to ensure that we couch it with things that we can have influence over. Like if you're reviewing someone's security architecture that I wouldn't say we have any, I wouldn't want to say that we have expertise there. We're just trying to suggest things that can be measured objectively. So how you implement something can yield your overall security posture. Like I didn't set up any authentication, you are less secure. And that's not, that's a decision that you made, not something that we would look for versus say vulnerability scanning is just something that would be more of an objective risk point versus say how you chose to implement something. So I just wanna make sure that the things that we choose to measure are sit in that objective category versus subjective implementation. Cause I don't wanna become a security architect recommender. <laughs> Yeah, I think I got your point and make a lot of sense to me. One other way we could look at this is to look at what people out there are doing. And when we see like what folks are doing, we can just categorize and say, look, this is the common practice out there. Then we can now say, okay, as opposed to sometimes might be this is the best practice, like a design pattern, this group of people are following this. And if you just report in a kind of summarized way, instead of being causal, like cause and effect, or things like that, which might resolve to the kind of things you mentioned. Other thoughts on my model that I spent, I jotted these things down, that I spent hours on. So this doesn't solve like how we, think about dependencies, right? This doesn't like solve the issue of mapping dependencies, but it starts to, I hope, address, there's, there's kind of two parts to dependencies. One is right mapping. <laughs> I, I gotta figure out what I care about. This is only based on what I'm hearing. And then the second is I, I wanna ask questions against that suite of things that I care about. And the the questions that always seem to be that people seem to want to ask all the time are around licensing, <laughs> around vulnerabilities, and maybe those are the two biggest things. And so, yeah. and the, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of license scanning and other kind of vulnerability. We don't. Nobody does security vulnerability testing, and the risk working group uh, is having 
a pretty active discussion about how to incorporate that into the risk metrics right now. There are a lot of things out there um, that, 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 that are databases. There's the NIST database, but then there's also some tools that Google offers. From That's that OSV one that I just put in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there are, there's a lot uh, to look at from a risk perspective. And it, this, this may be one of the things because there are so many existing tools that we could build a hackathon around. Not to make it about that, but there's, there's enough different tools out there that we could actually get into it with software. And but like, but like, yeah. what are the what are the tools? So like, the NIST database is agreed certainly one. Yeah. But I think this OSV, from what I understand from Google, is trying to get around or trying to overcome a lot of the inherent complexity in the NIST database query. Like it's yeah, super I, I, hard. I'll just I'll just give the risk group should be fun this week. I've talked to I'm talking to four people from the group who have a lot of uh, different pieces of software on the list that I'm trying to consolidate that list. And it's, and, and I'm doing that in advance of the working group meeting because in, there's so much about dependencies that's being talked about. The same seems to apply to software. I'd like to focus the discussion on, on where, we, where we work, but so, so I'll, I'll, the, I'll, there'll be a comprehensive list in the risk working group notes uh, is Thursday. The, is the tooling in what you're talking about about determining dependencies? Some or is the it. tooling about it also um, asking questions against that list? Some of it's security vulnerabilities, some of it's looking at dependencies. Um, let me complete my list and okay. share it in the risk working group um, because I'm a little bit overwhelmed by all of the things that have been shared with me so far. So, so maybe in an effort, like you have a good handle on kind of, well, no, but like you're in, you're in a good position to think through the available tooling. Like I think the conversations that come at you um, can maybe make sense right away. So if, if we're gonna start yeah. talking about this to a group that doesn't talk about dependencies and licensing and vulnerabilities on a day-to-day -day basis, Maybe at some point we need to start kind of narrowing down the band of things that we're working with. So right. in the chaos project, we're always talking about just trying to move off zero, right? right? So we're just trying to improve transparency on a known set of dependencies in a particular case. And here are some tools that can help provide some transparency on that. Is yeah. Phosology Scanner perfect? No, it certainly is not. Is OSV perfect? Probably not. No. And so, but are they better than not asking questions? You know, so maybe part of the goal is to narrow this down because I, I'm with you. I feel like oftentimes in whether it's the Asia Pacific call or the risk call, it gets so wide so quickly and just trying to rein it in a little bit might not be bad. Yeah. The, there's a little bit of drinking from several fire hoses. So it's not so much getting off a of zero as it is trying to stand up with so much information already out there being shot at you. It's a, it's, it's a real different situation than like where we started with chaos. I Sophia looks like she made a thought. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really like your approach because I think the trouble that we've been facing in, in the working group is trying to solve this problem theoretically and practically at the same time. And I think those are two di very different questions. <laughs> so I think we spent a lot of time trying to theoretically organize our thoughts, but now I think it's important to focus more on what's practically available. So I like the idea of going through, seeing the available tooling, the available data sets and what we could actually measure and achieve on a repeatable basis. Um, so I'm almost thinking of say that the scenario of bringing something like this to a hackathon would be to explore how feasible is it to measure something like this? Um, using the tools available to us. And then when we recommend this is how you implement or measure something like this, we know it can be measurable <laughs> versus just saying, wouldn't it be nice if you could see this, which is where we kind of are now. Um, whereas looking, looking backwards from the tooling would be a little bit more practical on what's achievable now. One conversation that I'm hoping to bring onto the 
podcast soon is with a downstream user of open source. And if you're looking only at what, what information do we need from our dependencies, the approach that we'll be talking about is very quick and dirty, high level, just what's the activity level like? Uh, and I mean, that's a valid place to start. We don't have to bring in all of the complexity of vulnerabilities and whatnot. If it's just, a, we just want to get started and then we can add those later. Should add that to, to the stack here, right? In between managed package information and the license scanner stuff, just activity. Uh, uh, Gear, you, are you uh, hoping to see a kind of discussion that relates the downstream loose in loose couple completion with the upstream, or just like they are tightly coupled? That like if uh, feedbacks on regular basis truly strongly depends on the upstream. The conversation that we are framing for the podcast is purely the downstream user's perspective looking at the packages that they're using. Okay. So there's no communication with the upstream. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Well, okay, I can, this is helpful. I'm sorry I keep bringing dependencies up like every time I appear on a screen, but this just has this feeling of one of those like shall go on forever in this like kind of cloudy space. And we'll, at some point I would, I think it's good to kind of bring it down to earth somehow. And I don't know what that somehow might be, but. I'll keep making diagrams. <laughs> Let's keep doing it. We appreciate it. you. Matt, we appreciate that. You bet. Some of us are visual learners like myself, so <laughs> it, that makes sense. Uh, we are almost out of time. So um, just wanted to mention two quick things that are still on the agenda. Uh, first is the Google Summer of Code. We are just finalizing the ideas and there is a doc in the minutes, um, assuming that people can click on that and add their feedback. And then, um, is that all, Georg and Sean? Was there anything specific? So, so um, one thing that one of the things is for the projects uh, that we're listing. Like, I'd listed some Augur ones last week in a different document, and I didn't see them carried over to this document. So, I'm wondering where they went, and I'm trying to recreate them in this document now. Um, I'm sorry if I missed that document. If you have that link, we can copy them over. It's probably from, it's probably in last week's uh, minutes. I'll, I, I've already added one of them. So, um, but we have to create actual GitHub issues in the, in some repository at, before the, the 19th. Is that right? The way I see it, we don't need to have that piece with the micro tasks Cast. ready until the organizations are announced in March. So we just need the ideas and then we'll add the links to the micro task issues when they're ready. Okay. All right. So um, I'll, I'll finish fleshing out the, I, uh, let's, Maybe you and Elizabeth and I should have a 10 minute conversation on the 18th at some point, just to make sure we know what the list is collectively. Yeah, that works for me. We can figure that out. Yeah, just like 10 minutes, make sure we haven't missed anything because this is a different document than we were using last week. And there were some ideas that were not Remore Lab and Augur. So if anyone wants to flesh out, we know, thank you for your idea. If anyone else has some projects they would like to mentor, please email us or add it to this document.
And then one final um, just shout out to Sophia for being our newest panelist on Chaos Cast because she was so amazing as a guest that we were like, please come be a panelist because you are awesome and we love you. And she said yes. So congratulations to Sophia. And we look so we look forward to having you um, again and again on the on Chaos Cast because you really add a lot to the conversation. So thank you very much. And listen to that podcast if you haven't. Yes, I, I listened to it already, and I, it's always weird to hear your own voice. Um, I know. But like, you have to kind of suffer through it to make sure I didn't say too much about Google. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can never say too much about Google. I think the legal team would would argue with that statement. Well, yeah, yeah, the legal. Yeah. <laughs> Once you involve lawyers. All right, everyone, have a super day. Stay warm, stay safe, and we will see you all next time. All Take right. care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.